thank you all so much for coming. How was that keynote? Wasn't that fantastic? So great. We are thrilled to have you in this um, session with us tonight, navigating the home to workforce transition. We know, oh, thanks, Julie, sorry about that. I'll just leave that up right in front of you. Um, when uh, Susan and I were planning this evening and she came up with the theme of transitions, I jumped. I'm like, please, 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 can we talk about the home to workforce transition? This is a personal passion of mine, something that I uh, talk about all the time, that I research all the time, and it's something that's very close to my heart personally and professionally and with so many of the women that I know and love and care about. This is a, this is a tough, Tough thing to navigate and manage, so we're thrilled that you're here with us tonight. So I want to first of all introduce our amazing panelists. We are so thrilled to have this great group of women with us tonight. So I'm just gonna start here at my left. We have Jackie Nunez, who is the coordinator for UVU's Turning Point program, where she consults with, well, consults with clients, is responsible for outreach, serves on community agency committees, and oversees courses and workshops. We were talking about classes. I also made this paper too small. Jackie has worked with underserved populations, including individuals facing poverty, abuse, mental illness, disabilities, and those dealing with immigration issues. She received a master's degree in educational leadership from BYU, and recently she com completed a national career development facilitator training program. That is a mouthful. And she's a certified career development facilitator. Next we have Christine Zorek. I had to ask her tonight how to pronounce her name. I've read it so many times, but we met for the first time in person tonight. Christine is the director of HR at Four Foods Group. Over her career, she has launched HR departments from the ground up, served on the board of directors in an in, in executive leadership position, and partnered with chief officers to drive culture, enhance diversity, and establish human relations as a profit center. She has her senior professional and human resources certification, speaks professionally, moderates panel discussions, spearheads the women's group at Four Foods Group, and was recently featured by Utah Valley Magazine as a recognized woman in business. Christine holds a BS in business management from UVU, and she enjoys pushing her physical limits in various disciplines. That sounds exciting and scary to me, so that'll be fun. Okay, next we have Marilee Boyack. Marilee loves life and every season of life, especially this one. I love that first line of your bio. She enjoys hanging out with her hubby, four sons, two daughters-in-law, and two grandchildren, and discussing politics. She's an estate planning attorney whose law practice covers Utah and California. Marilee is also a professional lecturer, and she speaks all over the country, featured for many years at BYU Education Week and Time Out for Women, and she's a published author. Her current passion is serving as an executive director of Family Watch International. She's the author of several books and talks, including The Parenting Breakthrough, Strangling Your Husband is Not an Option. I would beg to differ. I think, I think sometimes it's true. Oh, there we go. We have some options there. And in trying times, just keep trying. And then finally, we have Julie DeAzevedo Hanks. Dr. Julie DeAzevedo Hanks is a self-care evangelist. I love that title, too. Author, relationship expert, media contributor, blogger, speaker, songwriter, and licensed therapist with 20 years experience counseling women, couples, and families. In addition to owning Wasatch Family Therapy, Hanks is a widely recognized emotional health and relationship expert on TV, radio, and print media. She is the author of The Burnout Cure, an emotional survival guide for overwhelmed women. And another book, too, because I have another book. Yeah, The Assertive This Guide for Women. I got both your books for Christmas last year, so. Um, Hank's most valuable experience has been in the trenches of family life as a wife to Jeff Hanks and the mother of four children. So let's give our panel a quick hand. I'm so to have you. So as we get started, we're going to play a little game. Okay. I just wanted I just wanted to set this stage a little bit with an overview of the labor force participation of women in the state of Utah. We have some ideas about women and work in Utah. And uh, we're going to find out if your ideas are accurate. So we're going to play over under. You guys know how to play that game? I'm going to give you a number. And if you think the actual number is over, put your thumb up. If you think the actual number is under, put your thumb down, OK? So the percentage of women in the state of Utah who are in the labor force, let's say 50%, over under. Over. This is an enlightened crowd. Oh, Grandma, I'm sorry. That was my mother. She's wrong. <laughs> She might have misunderstood the question. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. So a lot of people assume in the state of Utah, oh, 
We're a state that really prioritizes our families, right? We have women that are stay-at-home moms. Our women aren't working. That's not true. So the number is over, it is 60%. All women from the age of 18 and up, 60% of those women are in the labor force. Okay, how about mothers of preschoolers? Let's go 40% over under. Oh, we got some. It's actually 60%. 60% of mothers with preschool age children under the age of six are in the labor force. How about moms with kids in uh, preschool age and uh, six to 18? So kids preschool and school aged. Let's go with 40% again, over under. I have to mix this up because you guys are starting to figure it out. It is over, right? 50%. So the number goes down a little bit. Sometimes women, when they've got kids at home, preschool and school age, they're like, mm, I gotta drop out for a little bit, right? I gotta, I'm gonna go home, see what happens because these kids are crazy and they are. Um, okay, so one more. I, oh, so this final one I'm just gonna tell you. Uh, women with school age children only, okay? Kids ages six to 18. 73% of those women are in the labor force. That is our highest percentage, okay? So when, when women get all their kids off to school, they're like, hmm, ballet, uh, college, all these other things that I've gotta pay for, I gotta get back to work, right? And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. Now, I, I also wanna emphasize, staying home with children is not the only reason why people will step out of the labor force for, for a while, right? So this conversation isn't just relevant for women with children. It's relevant for anyone who has anyone in their life that they might need to care for, an aging parent, a sibling, um, or they step out of the workforce for another reason, a personal health issue, or they just want to, right? There are a lot of reasons. So, um, so this is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So I wanna ask each of our panelists to just take three or four minutes, introduce yourselves a little bit, and tell us a little bit about your personal experience I mean, your personal life and your personal journey and also your professional life and why you're here tonight. Jackie, go ahead. So my name is Jackie Nunez and I'm originally from El Salvador. I grew up in California from the time I was five. Um, and then I came to Utah when I was 18 to go to BYU. Um, I'm a mother of two kids, ages nine and seven. Um, like it was mentioned earlier, I graduated from BYU with a bachelor's in sociology and a master's in educational leadership. Um, while I was a student at BYU, I worked at the international office with students from around the world. Um, once I graduated, I worked in nonprofit um, and government agencies and programs like Head Start, WIC. Um, I've also been a victim advocate, um, and now I'm at Turning Point. Um, so. At times, I've been a student, a working mom, um, kind of all of the above. So um, I understand some of the challenges that come with having to juggle many things at once and being in the workforce as a mother. Okay, it's on. Um, my name is Christine Zorick, and like Robin said, I am the director of HR at Four Foods Group. Four Foods Group is a vertically integrated restaurant development group, so you'll probably recognize some of our brands, Meters, r and Barbecue, Robetta's, Swig, and we also have 74 Little Caesar stores in the Southeast, which is My a little My new BFF. <laughs> <laughs> the cookies are the drinks. We'll talk all okay. about. <laughs> all right. um, so I was originally born in Idaho, Pocatello, and we moved to Michigan for about six months, and then we lived in Augusta, Georgia, until I was seven, then we moved to Chicago, lived there until I was 15, then we moved to San Diego, where my parents know Mary Lee um, from. And then when I was 18, I came to UVU. Um, I planned on just getting my GEs done here and moving on, but I stayed and I graduated with my business management degree. I didn't really know um, exactly what I wanted to do with that, but I figured it was the more lucrative option over a history or English major. Um, and so, um, but I put myself through school, paid cash. Um, and that was huge because I gained the experience and applied the knowledge I was learning in school at the same time. Um, and I'm a huge proponent of staying out of debt. Um, and it's really worked for me. I was able to just pick up and move right on into my career. Um, so I, during school, I was working for a dental research institute, which is just up the road on Canyon Road in Provo, and it was a small group, so I 
I believe two things. If you're going into the workforce, you need to be willing and you need to be coachable. You need to want to learn. Um, and I was those two things. So I got to work in all aspects of the business, which gave me great experience. And um, once I finally started to get into HR, I moved over to a steel manufacturing plant, mostly blue collar. And I was the only female out of 80 to 100 males that worked there. So a lot of, a lot of good experiences with that. Um, <laughs> really good though, um, loved my group. Um, that's, that's been the most rewarding thing is really um, taking care of the employees that I'm there to, to help and advocate for. Um, once I left Pro Steel, then I actually um, left the workforce because I was married at the time, had a small son, he was two, and I left the workforce to work on family things. And at the end of the day, decided it was better and safer for my son to just be on our own. So we did that. And when Robin asked me to do that, I immediately, to do this, I immediately said yes, because I can speak to this on so many levels. Um, and I did personally have to re-enter the workforce. I took a job making $10 an hour. And, um, but I was able quickly to move up into a director of client services role with an HR consulting group, and then jumped over to an education company where I was the HR manager there. Um, and that's where I served on the board of directors and the leadership position. We went through some very challenging, turbulent times there. I just saw one of my old employees in the audience, so she and I caught up for a second. Um, and then, and luckily, I've been able to work for Four Foods Group. Um, and so I've, we were talking, I've done, since I decided to go out on my own, all of this on my own, my parents are in San Diego. Um, I have siblings here, but they're very, very busy. And so I've had to get very creative with how my son and I spend quality time together and then how I mitigate um, the requirements and need to be at work with um, being a really present mom. So that's a little bit about me. Oh, well, you already heard my bio, so um, I guess I would just add a couple of things. Um, I have what, what I, I, I remember one time a guy asking me what I did, and I told him all the things I did. I said, I mainly do a lot of things to avoid cooking. And <laughs> me too. Oh, oh my gosh. I hate it. <laughs> so anyway, um, and I remember him saying, oh, you have a portfolio career. And I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> I have a portfolio career. I, I didn't even know what that meant, and I remember thinking about that, and I thought, that was so true. When I started out um, uh, with um, having my children, I worked part-time in a, a law firm, and I remember going in and saying, I'll only work 20 hours a week. He said, the job's full-time. I said, give me two weeks to prove myself, and was able to work 20 hours a week, which worked well for my family. Uh, I then went out on my own and worked even less for a while, and, and as we were building our family, um, I probably only worked 10 hours a week, and then I realized that working from home was a great gig, um, and my, uh, I started working, doing my law practice from home, and no one had ever heard of that before, and, but families were really comfortable coming and sitting on my couch and having my kids throw paper airplanes at them, and you know, it worked really well, and so my career has kind of ebbed and flowed. Um, depending on where my family commitments were, where my political commitments were, and, and with volunteerism. And so that has, has been uh, a really nice thing. And I've just kind of added things. Instead of doing something nine to five, which shoot me now, I cannot handle, um, I just started adding in the, the speaking and the writing and then just added this new full-time position on top of everything else and totally gave up cooking entirely. <laughs> um, and I think that we can be really creative in the way we do things. Um, you don't have to do the 40 years, you know, working at the Piggly Wiggly. Uh, we can be super creative. Um, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for being here. This is a fun topic to talk about. Um, I remember my freshman year at BYU crying because I thought I had to choose between my music career and my education. And 
what I learned is that I didn't have to choose. So my, one of my philosophies is I refuse to choose. And I've been a mother and a working mother part-time uh, for almost 30 years now. I own my own business. So I have a lot of experience personally in balancing managing family life and, and work life. Um, so that's what I wrote about for my dissertation of a PhD in marriage and family therapy. And my topic was supporting creative productivity of mothers because they said, write about what you know. And I'm like, well, I know how to be creative and, and put stuff out there and write books and songs and stuff while I'm having a family. And so that's one of my passions is helping women weave together a life that they love that has all of their, their passions, um, including family, including work, including creativity together. And so I developed a model called the Partnership Model of Family Organization that I hope that I'll get to share a little bit about, but basically helping families work together uh, to take care of each other and to, to take care of the household so it's, the burden isn't just on the woman and so she can soar. <laughs> so that's me. Thank you so much. It is so interesting to hear your different personal experiences, how those have combined with your professional experiences and the things that you've done. So I'm excited to learn more from each of you tonight. So the next question I wanna ask is, in your experience, after women have taken some time out of the workforce, what is the biggest challenge they face when they try to come back? So I'm gonna start with you, Christine, and then we'll just work around this way. I'm gonna try to mix up. So I know for women, uh, we tend to second guess ourselves a lot, and we want to see perfection before we kind of take that step. So, in all of the research that Susan has done, which is amazing, um, she shows that women believe they need to be 95% qualified for the job where men will apply for a job if they're 50% qualified. Um, and so I think one of the biggest challenges is we need to set aside uh, that idea of perfection or I need to be almost there before I can apply for a job because we've already talked a lot about creativity um, and you have information at your fingertips now. So you can walk into a job and maybe you understand it, right? But if you don't know every single piece or every single skill, jump online. There's Khan Academy. <laughs> um, that's one of my favorites. I can get lost in Khan Academy. Um, there are books. There are so many online resources now, YouTube videos, that you don't have to be 95% or 100% qualified. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Trust yourself to know that you can get in and learn the skill or the job or whatever it is that you're going for. Um, what I see often at Turning Point is individuals coming in and feeling overwhelmed, not knowing where to start. Um, once they've made that decision or they realize I have to re-enter the workforce for whatever reason. Um, and so I think it's realizing that there are resources available, that um, there are individuals that will walk you step by step um, along the way to show you, okay, these are your options. Here's, um, you don't have to feel like you have to do it all at once. And be patient with yourself because it's not gonna be an easy process, um, but there are supports in place. With women in my therapy practice who are in this transition, uh, one of the common themes is paralysis. Like I need to do something, but I don't know clearly what I need to do, and so I don't do anything. And so what I would say, I see a lot of you nodding your head, what I would say is just pick something and go down that road and then you can back up if it's not the right one, but just take some action to get over that paralysis and that fear. And it's okay to change your mind a million times, but take a step. I also think for a lot of us, it's a head game. That you felt confident in a certain environment, but moving into a new environment, such as a career, you know, all of a sudden you're insecure and you're worried and you're nervous and you don't know what to do. And I think it's mostly here. Uh, if there's one thing I would say, it's uh, be fearless. 
And I, I was taught in my freshman year at BYU, I won't give the year, um, the act as if principle. I remember uh, learning the act as if principle. And if there's one thing I could say, it would be use uh, mirror therapy. Mirror therapy is free. I should write a book on that. <laughs> anyway, and you just look in the mirror, and every day I would say, I can do this. I can do this. Or I'm strong. And before I'd go on a date, I'd say, you are so sexy and fabulous. And my roommates would just die laughing. But guess who dated the most, right? So start acting as if you're confident. Just pretend. Just put it out there and just pretend. And you'll be shocked because people will start interacting with you as if you are confident. They'll think, oh my word, look at that confident woman. You know, she knows what it's all about. And you're inside going, oh man, if you only knew, right? Uh, but if you step into these environments, start talking to people, start interacting, start being assertive, and just every day in the front of the mirror just say, I can do this, I've got this, uh, you will be amazed uh, at how much faster and better you move forward. And all of a sudden you start believing yourself. It's kind of freaky, uh, but it works and it's free. <laughs> I love that. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, Jackie, that I just wanted to touch on really quickly, when you said that women find themselves in a position where they need to be going back to work. I think when, when I've talked to women about this issue, one uh, thing that I've heard come up over and over again is really a feeling of resentment. And that's something that, that maybe we can talk about for a minute. But, but sometimes, I loved what Ruth said tonight, but I can guarantee you your life's not gonna go down the path you thought it was going to, right? So I've talked to friends who said, but wait, I had a plan. My plan was I'm gonna be home with my kids, right? My plan was I'm gonna do something else, and then life throws us something we didn't expect. And so one, in addition to some of the other challenges of this is difficult, I'm not sure where to start, I don't feel totally qualified, part of this is this feeling, an emotional feeling of I shouldn't have to do this anyway, right? So does anybody have a thought, just quickly, I know we're going off script a little bit, but does anybody have something to speak to that and, and how we kind of deal with that feeling, this wasn't part of my plan, how do I get okay with the fact that now it is? Um, I think it, it's about changing your mindset and uh, making the most of that situation. Um, seeing that you, regardless of what brought you to that place, you bring um, strengths, um, experience, um, and the same things that have helped you in your home life as a mother uh, will help you in your career as you embark on that new journey. Uh, you have been able to manage, you know, um, schedules and tantrums and many things. And so um, looking back, I think that was mentioned in the keynote, sp keynote sp uh, speaker, just looking back and seeing I have done hard things in the past, I can do hard things in the future. Anybody else want to speak to that? Um, I love that. And I love the question. So personally, you know, I... I would say one of my greatest sorrows is that I haven't had more children. I have one son. I thought I'd have three. Um, and my son wants a sibling. <laughs> but, and we were talking about this a little bit. But um, at the same time, I, it's interesting because I haven't ever felt resentment. Um, I feel sorrow for the loss. But I've been able to replace that because when I you know, made that decision, I said that my son and I are going to be focused on a bright and happy future no matter what that is, whatever that may be. Um, and, and we've strived for that. And so even though maybe there's this hole, we've replaced it and filled it with other things and focusing on the positive. Look at all the things that we get to do that maybe we wouldn't have been able to do, right? If I had more kids and less financial resources or you know those were distributed or allocated out over more people, but and, and so we can't help our life. We can't blame ourselves for, for where we're at. We just need to focus on the positive and focus on the good. Um, and my son and I are extremely close, and I'm so grateful for that. One of my favorite quotes is by author Byron Katie, and she says, when you argue with reality, you lose, <laughs> but only 100% of the time. <laughs> and so, I think at some point, we have to look at the facts and, and kind of leave emotion out of it and go, the facts are, I have to work. I can argue with that all day. I can be sad about it for the rest of my life, or I can deal with the facts and move forward. 
I'm going to add a little slight twist. I've, I've never really resented working because I chose to. Um, but I chose to do it my way. But can I add another little perception there? Um, a lot of times, particularly, I've, I've been living in Utah about five years, it's a very different culture here. And there is a lot of guilt that is added. Oh, it's not that bad. I love it here. Anyway, she's laughing. Um, I think that there is guilt associated with working here far more than I have seen in other places that I have lived. Um, and there is an isolation, I think, sometimes, particularly among women. Uh, I know in my neighborhood, um, am I the only professional woman working? Uh, there's a couple others that, that work as well, and that's it. Um, of all of my closest friends, I'm the only one that works and has a career. So I, I understand that sometimes we feel different than those around us. And sometimes we feel a little bit isolated. Um, I would urge you to stay centered in your own path. Uh, stay centered in what is right for you. Stay centered in the answers that you have been given and the guidance and direction that you have been given. Um, don't let other people dictate what is right for you. Uh, not even your mother-in-law, even though <laughs> my mother-in-law is perfect. My mother-in-law is perfect. I love her. But I think that we also need to reach out to other women. Um, I know I live in Lehigh, and so we got together a bunch of, we call them the great women of Lehigh, we just got together a bunch of women to talk because we felt weird and unique and different, you know, and we wanted support in talking to one another. So feel free to reach out to other women and say, how do you handle this? You know, how has the path in your life gone? Um, and reach out and ask for the support that we need because uh, it can be a little bit different here. Uh, but you know what? I say we are powerful, strong women. We get to own it and, and do that. Own it. Um, that this is the right path for you. And then, uh, and not only that, extend your support to other people who need it as well. Thank you so much. So I've got a, we have women here with different areas of uh, expertise and different things. So I'm going to uh, focus a couple questions just on a few of you individually. So Jackie, over at Turning Point, what are the services and referrals do you provide there? And how do those things help prepare women to return to work? So I love something that our new president said recently. And she said, come as you are. And I feel like uh, Turning Point is a safe place where individuals can come as they are and just meet with one of us, um, a coordinator, um, and talk about their t specific situation and um, discuss plans and goals and, and dreams that they may have. Um, at the same time, depending on what brought them there, um, whether that's uh, facing a divorce or leaving an abusive relationship, uh, we can also connect them to resources in the community that can provide the supports that they need. And at times that's, you know, programs like Department of Workforce Services, local victim advocates, um, housing resources. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that women have those basic needs uh, met first then we inform them about classes and workshops that we offer. Um, if for some reason they have not finished their high school or need uh, computer skills, or maybe they have a bachelor's degree but feel like it's not necessarily something where they're able to make enough, mo uh, enough money to provide for their family, then we can also explore a uh, master's degree. So um, a variety of, of services to help and empower um, women to move forward um, from wherever they're starting. Um, we also offer free professional clothing uh, for women and DI, DI vouchers for men. Wonderful. I just want to mention we have some brochures from Turning Point over here. So if anybody is interested in learning more about that, we've got these up at the table, so come pick them up at the end. Thank you so much. Just to clarify, some of your meeting with you is free, yes. and some of the classes have a small fee? Or? So most of our classes, um, Usually our clients take them for free because it's on a sliding fee scale. And so if you are low income, then it's free. If not, it's not very much so. Um, and then, yeah, meeting with us is free and the clothing is free. Thank you so much. I've been in to visit with her before and it's so amazing to see the variety of classes and different things they have to offer. Such a great resource here, right here at UVU. All right, Christine, as an HR director, you see people coming to work, maybe some have taken some time off. Um, so what are some of the biggest hurdles you see for women as they come back to work? 
and how can they change their preparation to try to overcome some of those barriers? Such a great question. So, um, as I thought through it, um, I made a list, and we'll kind of talk through them briefly, but I think one of the major kind of barriers or hurdles um, is just the gender differences within the workplace. Um, there are unconscious biases, there are conscious biases, um, and so it's navigating those. And what I would say is look for, as you're coming back into the workforce, look for companies that align with your values. I cannot express how important that is to work for an organization that you can, that their mission, vision, and values resonate with you and what you're trying to accomplish in your life. And um, being cognizant of that, what industry or profession are you trying to get into or are you in that you're re-entering? Um, and is that male or female dominated? Because that is going to make a difference in kind of your ability to grow and progress there. Um, it's important to find an organization that supports women leadership, um, that has real diversity and inclusiveness initiatives. To the, and what I mean by real is a lot of organizations, right, it's a trendy thing right now. They have DNI, um, maybe, you know, committee or something like that, but are they living what they're preaching? And are there, you know, is their executive team fair and equitable? Is it diverse? Things like that. So, um, but personally, I would start watching your kind of language differential. Susan has a lot of research on this about um, male verbiage versus female verbiage and the words that we use. Um, I would also recognize your high, it, are you a high context communicator or a low context communicator? Um, we can notice that it's pretty clear between countries. Um, America is very low context compared to um, even Puerto Rico or Mexico that's very high context. And so, yeah, can you talk? Yeah, I was sure. gonna say, can you sure. So, so what that means is Americans talk very literally. In a meeting, we'll talk through our action items, our agenda, and at the end of the meeting, we'll summarize everything and say, okay, so-and-so, I need this by this date, and so-and-so, I need this by this date. And then we're all clear, we all leave, we work on our action items. Um, Mexico, France, very high context. So they don't talk in directives. Um, it's, yeah, we'll get to it at some point, and yeah, I kind of guess that's what we're doing. That's how we see it. Um, so I would just recognize, as people and regionally in America, we kind of vary on our contextual languages. There's a lot of research online, and I'm sorry if I'm going too deep. <laughs> um, I see a lot, sorry, I shouldn't have gone there and confused faces. But I would say just, just recognize how you communicate. I'll simplify it that way. Recognize how you communicate, because that will be important when you're working with a new organization um, and recognizing how they communicate as an organization, because it's very different. Organizations are the lifeblood of the CEOs that are running them, and so you want to make sure that you align there. Um, also, I would say know your adult learning style, and are you an auditory learner? Are you visual? Because that's going to make a big difference, right? If you go on to the job, you're coming back into the workforce, how are you going to learn during that training? And make sure that you're confident with your learning style. I am a very, very visual learner. All of my employees know that. So we diagram everything. I always have to have a whiteboard marker in my hand, and if they're trying to explain something to me, I just give them the marker and they know to go put it up there because I'm visual. So if they say it to me, it's, they just know it's not gonna stick. Also, everyone at work knows that I have my notebook, and if I'm in a meeting, I'm doodling because I, that's just how I make my associations and how I remember. So I would say know yourself really, really well so when you get into the workforce, when you're working with a company, you can align with that company better and you're going to be more successful that way. Thank you so much. That's interesting. I, I like how you're talking about because sometimes when we're away from the workforce, we're kind of when we're in our homes, we're kind of running the show, right? We can do things our own way and preparing yourself kind of intellectually and mentally to do some self-assessment, figure out what type of learner you are, what type of worker you are. So you're preparing to work with a group of other people where you're not running the show anymore, right? We're gonna have a boss, we're gonna have coworkers, and getting ready to do that is gonna be really important. Wonderful, can you pass the mic down to Julie? 
All right, Julie. So here's our big moment for partnership families. All right, one of the biggest hurdles that so many women face is I've been at everybody's beck and call for the last how many years? I can't tell you, my daughter just walked in. I have to remind her all the time, no, I can't bring you your volleyball jersey. I'm at a work meeting. But the kids were used to that for so long. So what can we do to help our families all work together to prepare for this transition? Well, I think um, the first thing is to frame it as a family transition. It's not just a mom transition. So. I like to think of our household as a family farm, and everyone has a role to play. Um, if you've been doing all of the chores in the family farm as the mom, you're going to have to start letting some of those go and delegating to other people, um, to your partner, to your kids. So framing this as our work instead of my work. Because you're gonna, what's going to happen is you're going to have two full-time jobs which is called the second shift. So when women go work full time, then they come home and they have their second shift of all the household duties. So that might mean kids are doing their own laundry. That might mean everybody takes a dinner night. That mean, that's, might mean the spouse has more um, household chores or does carpool. So framing it as a family transition and that family work is for the family, it's not just the mom. And so I think that's where you have to start um, watch your language. Don't at, say, will you help me by doing the dishes? No, you're helping your family. Our, I say, our family thanks you for unloading the dishwasher. Our family, because it's not my dishwasher. So, so letting go of that language of this is mine and having it be ours is really, really important. We don't use the word help in our house, it's, you know, don't, I don't say, will you help me by doing the laundry? No, it's your laundry, do your laundry. <laughs> it's, you're not helping me. So um, framing, framing things differently and watching your language is, is the, a great place to start. Prepping your partner, if you have one, that this is gonna require more of them. And what I often see is overwhelmed women who are having a hard time um, delegating to their spouse or the spouse isn't taking on more of the, the household things. And that's, that's a really common um, hot spot for couples, right? You're not doing enough, uh, and men aren't socialized the way women are. And so there's a learning curve for uh, male partners to start seeing what needs to be done because they haven't been taught their whole life that their home is a reflection of their worth as a human being, <laughs> right? And so part of that transition is you letting go of your home and your children as a reflection of your value as a human being. They're people, you live together, you work together, uh, they're not a reflection of you. And your house is just a house, you are not your house. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> yes. Owner of the dirtiest home in the world. I applaud that. <laughs> no, I, I, we, we, we yeah. have a duel, right? Right. So, um, one more thing. Do you ever, I, I loved what you were saying about the managing the conversations and the language that we use. When you start, it, when we start receiving some pushback, some resentment from our spouses, like, or from our kids, like, you're always at work, da, 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 you know, stuff like that. Do you have any tips for us to, to kind of handle those communications when we're receiving some negative and some resentment on the fact that we're yeah. working again? The guilt is gonna be there, especially when you're first making the transition. Um, but if you can make this as guilt-free as possible and really stand on your own two feet, you're gonna get pushed back. Your kids are gonna be like, well, you used to make my lunch for me every morning and you used to make, right? Or your husband's like, well, you know, where's dinner? And you both just get home at 6.30. It's like, well, why is this my job? Like, <laughs> you know? So you're gonna have to stand really strongly um, on your own two feet and not expect them to be thrilled about this change, but to require them to, to make changes. And it's okay to say, why is this my job? You know, the, we need to share this now. So you're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for dinners. Let's, let's move forward. And to add to that, you know, within our work teams, and we focus on 
you know, proper project management <coughs> and planning. And planning has to be, has to be at least a quarter, you know, of the entire project. Um, and so my son and I have these conversations, but essentially that's what you're doing. And if you know that this is something that you're thinking about, let your family know and start setting those expectations and talk through what the different scenarios will be and what the different days will be like so that they can at least start to wrap their heads around, okay, our schedules are gonna change, it's gonna be a little different, mom isn't making dinner every night, right? We're sharing, we're sharing the load equally, and so we both need to contribute equally, you know, within work and house, so. So Marilee, reading your bio is also kind of dizzying. So many, so many, uh, so much variety in the different things that you've done, and part-time, full-time, over more than full-time, different things like that. Can you share with us some of the things that have really worked well for you in your life of managing heavy work responsibilities, heavy home responsibilities, and then maybe some things that haven't worked so well? Cooking hasn't worked so well, <laughs> but anyway. Your sense of No. Um, yeah, and, and I spoke about how my career has changed and evolved and been flexible over time. Um, and right now it's very, very heavy. You know, I'm, I'm putting a lot of hours right now. And so we had to have that conversation. And I said to my husband, I can take this new job, but you're taking over the cooking. It was the happiest day of my life. I would have done it years ago. Anyway, um, I would say, uh, first of all, there is no such thing as work-life balance. You will never be balanced. Um, it's just not gonna happen. So I refer to it as work-life harmony. And sometimes one will take the melody and sometimes another. Um, and and if, if you look at it that way, it's a little bit better than thinking things will be equal, because they never will. They never will be equal. Um, and I would say probably the most important thing, everybody says, how do you do so much? I fight for first things first. Um, so often as women, the most important things to us get shoved to the dregs of the day. And then at the end of the day, when we're exhausted, we're supposed to all of a sudden do those things that are important to our own personal development as well. Um, and I would suggest the exact opposite. Uh, when I took this uh, new position on as executive director, another full-time job on top of everything else, I was very, very worried. I had breast cancer 10 years ago, and I have studiously been careful not to get myself overwhelmed and overstressed, because I absolutely believe that's what caused the, uh, that to take hold. Uh, so when I layered this in my life, I thought, how in the world am I supposed to do this? I knew it was something I was supposed to do, but I thought, how am I supposed to harmonize this with my life? Um, through a very interesting series of events that occurred at Education Week, um, I was told to get up at 5 a.m. Uh, this is interesting because for 10 years I have had to fight for my sleep because of the medication that I was on. Uh, but I'm finally, praise be, off the meds, and I'm finally starting to sleep again after 10 years. And so I get up at 5 a.m., and I put first things first. So I, I'm a woman of faith, so I do my prayers and my scripture study, which is now lovely, way more than five minutes than it used to be. Um, I do meditation uh, to keep my stress levels down. Um, I read, and I realized my reading had fallen by the wayside. It was my favorite thing to do. And so I'm up there early in the morning reading um, and studying and evolving and, and, and studying all these things. Uh, I do my exercises. Um, and by the time the day starts for everyone else, I have done my first things first. Now I'm not saying that's the answer for everyone because the answer for me for 10 years was get as much sleep as you can, okay? So your answer is gonna be different. What I'm saying is if we put our first things first, then we will have the energy we will have the guidance and the direction that we need. We will have time to ponder and meditate and be inspired on what directions we need to go in. You will find clarity when you put first things first. So I think that that is just hugely important for women. And, quit putting, and, and frankly, it teaches our children as well to treat women with respect. I think so often we treat ourselves with disrespect and then wonder why our children imitate those behaviors. Treat yourself with respect. Your spouses will respect you better. Your extended family will respect you better. Even your neighbors, everyone. When you put your first things first in life, um, you will have that uh, ability then to manage all the other things that are gonna try to drain you dry all day long. 
Thank you so much. That's so important. We, so many of us feel like our lives are so full with our home, and then we think, oh, I'm adding this whole extra element. I don't have time for the things I'm already doing. Now I'm going to be adding a job. But it's so important in those two things that we're doing that are huge to not forget what's most important. And that can be different for each of us, but making sure that we're taking care of ourselves is absolutely critical. Um, I think also with that, it's important to, when you are thinking about reentering the workforce, to look at jobs that will work with what you value. Uh, so if that's family, well, perhaps you, you need to look for a job that's gonna be flexible um, so that you can be there for your kids. And so luckily for me, um, in all the jobs I've had, I've been able to kind of integrate both. And so sometimes that means that my kids come with me to events and they carry my stuff and I make it fun for them. And so they're working with me as well. So. And I, I want to add to that. I think that that's a brilliant point. Um, I think it's good to ask for what we want. And so if you are looking at a position and you want Mondays off, I think boldly say, I will be taking Mondays off and you will get more work from me Tuesday through Friday. Or you may say, I will work two days a week from home um, or you know whatever. I think we need to ask for what we want and then prove that we're worth it. And say, I remember with the, my first job as an attorney, I only wanted to work 20 hours a week. I said, I will do this. And then I proved it, right? And so you can prove that. Ask for what you want, craft this around your life, and then say, give me two weeks to prove this and then dazzle them and they'll be, oh my word, she's fabulous. This is awesome, right? And, but I think that we need to wrap our careers and our jobs around our life, not vice versa. Not vice versa. And so she's exactly right. Look for those things that are gonna work well. Sometimes it's starting your own business. Yeah. Right, girl? Yeah. Sometimes it's working from home. Um, and, and I think we just need to be really assertive in creating uh, you know, the life that we want very intentionally instead of just taking a job, working nine to five, I think we can be really assertive in asking for what we want. Thank you so much. So I wanted to talk a little bit about imposter syndrome. Are you guys all familiar with that term? It's this feeling that we've got this outer, you know, I, I appear confident, I say I know what I'm doing, but on the inside I really don't know what I'm doing. And everybody else around me knows what they're doing, but I don't know what I'm doing. And that's very common among women. And I think especially for women who are looking at a professional change when they've been out of the workforce for a while. So where is our mic? Julie, Julie I wanted you to start with this one. How can we deal with imposter syndrome, especially when we've taken a break from work? I think you accept that you're going to feel that way. I go in and out of that still. And I've been in my career for 20 plus years. I, I have a PhD, sometimes I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be found out that I really don't know anything. And I go in and out of that still, so just expect that you'll have times where you feel like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be found out that I really don't know what I'm doing. But guess what, nobody really knows what they're doing. That's the great thing. Like, we're all just trying to figure it out together. So, I mean, some people are better at faking it than others, but we're all just trying to figure out how to be better workers, how to be better human beings, how to be better with our families. So I just say expect it and, and go, yeah, here's the imposter syndrome. Okay, moving forward, you know. <laughs> like just expect that you're gonna have those feelings and that it's okay and that's, it's just part of the process of doing something that's scary, having that anxi anxiety about not knowing what to expect. So it's totally normal. Christine. I would say to go along with that, if you when you start to feel that way, just take a step back and remember your successes. Remember the times when you did know what you were doing or that you were able to speak to someone something and you were recognized for that or someone, you know, um, admired your insight or your creativity, whatever it was. Um, and and one of the things that I do with um, my team is we've completely removed the word failure from our vernacular. And we don't talk about failure, and what we talk about is feedback, and that's information to help us improve. 
And so as a team, we can have very clear and transparent conversations because we know that no one is jumping down each other's throat. We're not blaming anyone for something going wrong. We've taken fault out of it. We're accountable, but we don't place fault on anyone if something didn't go wrong. We just share the feedback so we can all improve. And I think that's important because we're just focusing on um, continual growth and improvement and, and not falling into this negative self-talk or you know negative team talk where it's just debilitative. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to imposter syndrome? I, oh, do you want to check? Um, as I was thinking about um, imposter syndrome, um, what came to my mind is that when in one of our classes at Turning Point, it's managing life transitions, we talk about transferable skills. And we have a long list, and you can even Google that. You know, what are some transferable skills from home to workforce? And so realizing that you do have legitimate skills and going forward confidently um, that you're not being an imposter, you, you do have something to offer, um, and that can include volunteer work, or it can include um, service in community or religious organizations. Thank you so much. That's a perfect transition into a question that I think is so important for all of us, so I'd love everybody to just touch on it quickly. Uh, I've got my gorgeous sister up here, and she once told me she wished that someone would create an app that would translate all the work that we were doing at home into business work. So you could type in PTA president, and it would list out all your work, all your professional skills that come with that. So if anybody wants to build that app, million dollars in the making, right? So how do we, we've, we haven't been sitting around doing nothing, right? When we've been out of the workforce, how do we take the experiences in our homes, with our families, in our volunteer work, church service, other things that we're doing, how do we mentally and then also outwardly translate that into our next step? I think we need to give ourselves more credit for what we're doing at home, right? So if you really think through everything that you do, inventory control, right? You're, you're the one doing the shopping. You are making the list of what's low, what's out. You are right acquiring you're actually purchasing so you're working on you could be working on purchasing contracts right with what you have to buy for the home if you're negotiating contracts with your cable carrier wi-fi you know all of those things start thinking through it and giving yourself credit for what you're doing supply chain um transportation right control i mean look at everything that you're doing if you and your spouse or if you are managing your finances everything that goes into that. Now you're budgeting, you're planning, you're forecasting. I mean, everything that you're doing at home relates to business, and you definitely have to give yourself credit for that, and then recognize the full spectrum that you are managing because you're running a house. And I wanna to speak to volunteer work. Um, this position that I just got as executive director was because I volunteered for two years uh, with this organization. Um, and after they saw the value that I could bring to the organization, they offered me a full-time position. I said, you have to pay me. And they said, is that all? You bet. Um, and I doubled my income overnight. Why? Because I volunteered. So please do not ever under, uh, underestimate your volunteer work. In fact, I just hired two people last week. Why? Because of their volunteer work. I said, give me a resume and list all the volunteer work you've done. That's what I wanted to see. And that's why they got hired was because of their volunteer work. Um, I used to be living in Southern California and was extremely involved in the community. I got elected to the city council. Uh, why? Because of my volunteer work. And man, that gig paid really well. Uh, it was awesome. They still pay me a pension because they're stupid and it's California. So that's my husband's favorite volunteer work because I get paid till the day I die. So um, never underestimate the power of your volunteer work. List it all, okay? and put in there, really put in there your leadership skills, right? Oh, I led a team of 30 people. They don't know that it's the PTA, okay? But I say own it, right? Um, you know, I coordinated the efforts for major events. You know, here's, I've done major events with, you know, a thousand people. Put that in there and own that volunteer work. That can lead to incredible job opportunities um, that you can segue from volunteer work into professional work. Um, and Never underestimate your ability to network. And oh my word, Utah's crazy. Everyone's connected here. I have to like really watch what I say because everybody knows everybody in this state, right? It's insane. So use that networking ability that you're getting from your neighborhood, uh, from your church congregations, 
from your you know, volunteer work at the Humane Society. Uh, start building a spreadsheet for yourself, okay? Keep the list of all those contacts. List what they do. Build your own LinkedIn, right? You know what LinkedIn is. It's a lovely networking thing. Build your own, okay? Merrily Boyack's LinkedIn, right? And start listing all those people, all your cousins. Everyone here is related, right? <laughs> List all your cousins and your nieces and your nephews and everything that they do. Um, and start to keep your own database because all of a sudden when you say, well, I am looking for this, these three people might help me. Um, those are unbelievable opportunities that you have that other people don't have. Uh, a lot of them are sitting in there working behind in their little cubicles. Uh, and you're out networking like crazy and building connections like crazy that are going to really further your portfolio career. Thank you. Julie. Amen. I just say, I, yeah, I just echo what, what's been said already. Perfect. Jackie, you have something to add on that? Um, uh, regarding building your network, I think um, don't start until you're ready to enter the workforce. Start now. So it, it happens throughout your everyday as you're building connections at school, at church. Um, and usually, uh, individuals find a job through someone they know and people hire who they know. All right, it's about time to wrap up. I just would like to ask each of you to just take one minute and give this wonderful group of uh, people here just their, your final words of advice and encouragement, inspiration, whatever you want to share, profundity, right, about uh, making this transition work for them. So who wants to start? After that, uh, we'll start here. I just want to say you can do this. It's it's terrifying to make a change, but you can do this. And so many women have have transitioned successfully from home full time to the workforce. But like you're in good company. Um, and another thing I want to say is lift other women around you. No matter where you are, see women as your allies, not a threat. And if we all work together to lift each other, to befriend the new person, you know, that we, we can be so powerful. Um, too often women are competitive with each other, but we are our best allies, and, and that goes for the workforce as well. Thank you. I would say build your dream. Um, just get out a piece of paper. Um, or for you young pups, pull out your phone, and, <laughs> and just start throwing down words of what is your dream. What does your dream look like in 10 years? What is your professional dream, your personal dream, your, uh, in fact, I love the dream coach, if you ever uh, want to get online, she's fabulous. Uh, but build your dream, your relationship dream. What does your dream life look like? Um, write that down. Um, I love vision boarding. Um, I use my computer as my vision board. Uh, but write those things down, and then I read them out loud in front of the mirror. I told you I love the mirror. It just, you know, it's cheap. And and just start really envisioning and and aim high. You know, not you know I want to work five hours you know a week at Walgreens. Aim really high. If you could design your perfect dream, what would it look like? And start reading those things. Have them in front of your vision every single day. Start reading those things out loud to yourself every single day. You will be shocked. Uh, I remember they had me do this in college. I describe myself in 10 years from now. And I remember encountering that piece of paper. Every single thing on that piece of paper had happened and more. Um, so uh, I would really, you guys can do incredible things, you know, and incredible things. You are amazing, powerful women. If you, don't, if you feel like an imposter in the boardroom, oh, give me a break. You look at all those people in the boardroom and you think, man, you could not last five minutes in my house. I raised four boys. <laughs> Hello. They, they couldn't last five minutes in your house, guys. They couldn't do what you do. You've done amazing things. And your future is going to be incredible. It, the opportunities that are out there now, astounding. Uh, so I really uh, want to encourage you to aim, aim high, dream big. Um, you will be shocked at how much you are able to do. And it doesn't mean you have to do something important from a world standpoint, okay? You can be just magnificently successful in becoming the great version of you. And that may be the lady that, you know, crochets 100 beanies for Bolivia, whatever. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be by the world's definition of success. It can be by your definition of greatness. Thank you. Christine. Um, I am saying it in a different way. Absolutely believe in yourself. Um, we all have a unique light within us, and that speaks to us, and you're here because you feel that in some way, and you're, you're searching to, for fulfillment and to accomplish that. Um, and don't ever listen to anyone that tell you you can't do it because of your situation and your circumstance. Um, I was having this conversation earlier this week with someone, and I had a lot of family members and a lot of friends tell me I couldn't do certain things when I became a single mom. I don't define myself as a single mom. I'm a working parent. And I do that because it's in head, because it, it continues, it allows me to grow. Um, and it, it doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. They don't define you. And you can be creative and you can be unconventional and you go after what's successful and fulfilling for you. That's all that matters. Thank you. Um, I think always have a plan A and a plan B because life usually doesn't go as we planned. Um, and start with those plans now. Um, remember that you're not alone um, and be gentle with yourself in the process. Um, and another thing about starting now, that can mean taking a class, joining a professional association, um, doing something that you're passionate about that might start your journey. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this this evening. I hope that you've learned a lot. I just want to let all of you know, I, I just want to echo what all of you have said. These panelists have been just fantastic tonight. Uh, we have so many resources and things av available for you at the Utah Women Leadership uh, Project website. I know that Turning Point and there are other organizations as well. So if this is a, if this is a step that you're ready to take or if you're thinking about it five years from now, I love what you said, get started now. It's a long journey, but know that there are things out there to help you.